2 Samuel chapter 21. We'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement, that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver, nor gold of Saul, nor of his house. Neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. And they answered the king, The man that consumed us, and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remi remaining in any of the coast of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul. And the Lord did choose. And the king said, I will give them. Well, what a blessing. Happy Mother's Day. Isn't that a wonderful story? Hmm? You know, uh, you, you watch some of these TV evangelists and they'll lie to you. They don't preach passages like this. They'll tell you that if you send them a, a dollar, God will send you ten dollars. Of course, they never ask for a dollar. They always ask for more than that. And they'll tell you that only good things are going to happen to you and nothing bad is going to ever happen. You know how I know man didn't write the Bible? Because the story's like this. Now notice, first of all, there's a dearth in the land. Verse number 1 said there was a famine for three years. Can you imagine not having it rain for three years, not having a garden for three years, not having any vegetation for three years? That happened in Israel. There was a dearth. The dearth came because of a detriment. Back in John with chapter number 9, you find that the Gibeonites uh, 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 hoodwinked Joshua into making a pact with them, and Joshua swore, swore an oath before God that Israel would not destroy the Gibeonites. And that pact stood all the way up till Saul the king, and in his zeal, he broke the oath, and he started slaying them. And as a result, then God said, there'll be a famine in the land. Can I say, when you make an oath before God, God takes that very serious. Matter of fact, God told us not to even swear an oath. Because God knows us and knows that we have a hard time keeping things. You know, I remember back in the day, people used to make packs on a handshake. Now you've got to sign in triplicate and people still break it. But we find that because of this detriment, the Lord has frowned upon Israel. David inquires of the Lord. The Lord tells him why there's been a famine, and David invites the Gibeonites to him, uh, and he says, what do you want? They said, we don't want any of Saul's gold. We don't want any of his silver, and we don't want you to do anything. We don't want you to kill them. So what we want is for you to give us seven sons of Saul. He said, we'll hang them. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and they fell all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. We find a dearth, we find a detriment, and here we find death. Now, you wouldn't expect to hear this especially on Mother's Day. But hold on. I want you to look at verse number 10. The Bible said, And Rizba, the daughter of Ai, took Sathcloth and spread it for her upon the rock, 
from the beginning of the harvest until the water dropped upon them out of heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beast of the field by night. I'm interested in this woman by the name of Rizpah. Can I say that Rizpah was disgraced? Rizpah was one of Saul's concubines. Now, a concubine wasn't a wife. A concubine was called upon for certain favors. The concubine had no rights of the king, had no blessing from the king. The fruit of a concubine or the children born of a concubine got all the blessings of the king, but the concubine did not. She's a disgraced woman. She's had no hope. She's been abused. Uh, she's never been loved. She's never been cared for. Uh, she's disgraced uh, in Israel. We see she's disgraced. We also find that she's despondent. Look in verse number 8. The Bible says, But the king took the two sons of Rizba. We find that the only thing that she had to rejoice in was two sons. And the king, David, gave her two boys to the Gibeonites. Can you imagine how despondent she is? She's had no husband to love her. She's had no home to call her own. She's had nothing to rejoice in save the two sons that she bore. And this day, her sons are with five others hanging on a hill of the Gibeonites. Can you imagine how heartbroken she is? All that she ever loved is now gone. She's disgraced. She's despondent. But she's devoted. Verse number 10 tells us that from the day of the barley harvest, uh, 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 the beginning of the harvest, uh, all the way until it began to rain, uh, 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 when it was reaping time, some five months she stayed out there. Uh, and by day she wouldn't let the fowls uh, come on those carcasses. Uh, and by night she wouldn't let the beasts come on those carcasses. Uh, she stood there, uh, stood her ground, uh, and showed her love to not only her son, but other women's sons for five months. What devotion. We see she's disgraced, she's despondent, she's devoted. But notice she's distinguished. Look at verse number 11. And it was told David what Rizbah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. Here's this woman that had no notoriety, had nothing. She's been disgraced. But all of a sudden, word starts to spread about her devotion. Word starts to spread about how concerned she is about those carcasses. And it gets all the way to the ears of the king, David, the greatest king Israel ever known. And she becomes distinguished. Hmm? I dare say that the president don't know our name. Hmm? But can I say the king knew who she was? Heard her name. Heard of her testimony. Heard of what she had done. Now she is deferenced or respected because of it. Look at verse number 14. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin and Selah in the sepulcher of Kish his father. And they performed all that the king commanded after that God was entreated for the land. We find also that uh, uh, verse 13, that's the verse we should have, and he brought up from thence the bones of Saul the, and Jonathan his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. She is respected because David sends for the bones. And he buries them in the sepulcher of a king. Hmm? And because those boys were hanged, the famine was over. God is not mocked, friend. God is a God of love. God loved us so much, He sent His only begotten Son to the cross of Calvary.
free uh, who bled and died for our sins, not for his sins. Uh, he was God's perfect lamb, uh, but he bled and died for our sins. Uh, he was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. Uh, my dear friends, to give us life and life more abundantly. Uh, and listen, uh, 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 God uh, poured out his wrath, the wrath for all mankind on his son when he died on Calvary for you and I. Uh, and we do deserve the wrath of God. Uh, but because of the love of God uh, and because of what Christ did, if we'll put our faith and trust in him, uh, we are spared from the wrath of God. Uh, can I say God is a God of love, but he's also a God of judgment. He's a God of justice. He is a God that is angry with the wicked every day, but He loves and rejoices in the saints who have put their faith in Him. What a God. Can I say the beautiful thing about grace is I don't get what I deserve. Say, what did you get? I got Christ. I got eternal life. I got forgiveness of sins. I got hope that this world doesn't know about. What the world wants to know about is the love of God. But the world don't want to know about the wrath of God. And even here we see how stern God is about law and about judgment and about what's right and what's wrong. And even God allowed seven sons of Israel to be hanged to pay for the sins of one. You say, why would God do that? The same reason he let his own son hang on a cross and allowed all the ordinances and sins and laws that were contrary to us to be nailed to the cross, and Jesus paid for it all. Do you realize in the eyes of the law we were Gentile dogs? We don't even deserve to speak his name. But God made a way where even old Gentile dogs like us could be born again. And I'm not going to preach on that. I'm looking at Rizba here. I'm looking at the example here, and I want to preach for just a few minutes on a true mother. Now, can I say on this day, it's easy to run to Psalms 31 and preach about a godly woman. It's easy to look at Hannah. It's easy to look at Mary. It's easy to look at Elizabeth. It's easy to look at some of those women and say, wow, what a God. But let's look at Rizba for a minute. Some that most people don't consider. Saul certainly didn't. And for five long months, most of Israel didn't. But I see in her a true mother. Now, listen, I'm not insensitive today. I know that many of you are thankful for your mother, and many of you had a godly mother and a godly example, but some of you wasn't raised by your natural mother. Some of you aren't being raised by your natural mother. But God has blessed you to have a mother figure in your life. God has blessed you to have a real example of a true mother in your life. And you ought to be thankful for that. And that's the person I'm going to preach about today, a true mother. Can I say in the life of Rizba we see this, a true mother sacrifices for her children. I can say by Rizba's response to their death, there wasn't anything she wouldn't have done for them when they was alive. She was willing to sacrifice it all for her two sons. Can I say this? I don't know how old her sons were, but I know Saul's been dead for a long time. And these boys was all she had. And I'm sure there were times when uh, they had needs and she sacrificed the welfare of her own self for her children. Can I say a true mother is not a selfish mother? A true mother uh, is willing to do whatever it takes for her children. Can I say that one writer said that uh, uh, the greatest picture of God's love earthly-wise is the love of a mother for a child. Can I say all three of my children are here this morning. I love them. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. But that mama who carried them, that mama who nurtured them, that mama who knows them better than anybody, loves them even more. Can I say, a true mother will sacrifice. I've seen Miss Annette do without, so these kids can have. That's what a true mother does. She sacrifices. I'm sure Miss Shannon could talk about Miss Sonny sacrificing so she could run all them races and do all that she did. And you know what? That carried on to her. 
And she sacrificed for Emily. And then she sacrificed for Gracie. And now Emily's sacrificing for Riker. Because she knows he needs to be sitting back there, but she let him come up here, sit by Sydney, his girlfriend. Huh? Huh? So what's he doing? He's getting into mischief, I'm sure. Huh? But listen, that's what a mama does. She sacrifices. And there are times that the man who wants to be really just rigid, no, y'all not do that for them kids. You're going to spoil them rotten. She don't care. She's going to sacrifice. Hmm? This is what mothers do. True mothers. Not selfish. They sacrifice. Can I say this? A true mother is sacred before her children. Look again at verse number 10. I want you to notice something. We don't know much about Rizpah, but I can tell something about her character right here. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it upon, for her upon the rock. Can I say sackcloth was something that was instituted by God that when you're heartbroken, when you are in a place where you can grieve no more, you show the world your grievance by donning yourself with sackcloth. It's a form of devout, devoutness before God. And can I say a true mother will be sacred before her children. She'll raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. She'll raise them singing unto him, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. She'll raise them to understand that Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. She'll raise them to, uh, to uh, make them understand there's something special about church. There's something special about worship. There's something special about the singing. There's something special about serving God and living before God. Uh, she'll raise them to understand that Sunday morning's the Lord's day and we're going to go to church and we're going to worship the Lord. Uh, they're sacred before their children. Now, let me say, say something right now. Miss Crystal, you've raised them all the same. I, and I don't know if you're going to have any more. You, you've got them stair-stepped all the way down, you know. You got them from driving to just starting out. God bless you. But you've raised them all the same. Where's Nodhead? He's over here. Xander. You've raised all of them the same. And you're going to raise Elizabeth the same. Where's she at? Nursery? Hey, she ain't giving her up either, is she? Hey, little Elizabeth. How you doing? Caitlin's getting ready. She's going to have one a little over a year from now. I'm praying for twins. <laughs> Bella liked that idea. But you've raised them in church. You've raised them to know who Jesus is. You've raised them and showed them that you love Jesus and that you care about Jesus and Jesus is the most important thing in your life. But each one of them have a will. And you can raise them to be devout and you can be sacred before them and you can raise them to know about the Lord, but they all have a will. And Miss Whitney, that don't mean they're all going to turn out to serve the Lord. But you've raised them right, and a true mother will raise them right. Huh? But hey, listen, Mama, you might be here and your children might not be in church. Listen, take refuge in this. The Word of God's true. It's forever settled in heaven. And the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. They may not be in church today. They may be out in the world today. But if you lived a sacred life before them and you taught them right, uh, the Word of God is true, and they may be out there, but God's still dealing with them about how they're living. Uh, they know the difference. Bless the Lord. We find something else about true mothers. True mothers are stern with their children. Uh, true mothers will tell them what's right and what's wrong. And true mothers don't always give in. Now, grandmas and grandpas, they always give in. Uh, little Ella Rose don't even know how spoiled she is yet. Uh, Taya sent a video last night. She was trying to talk, and I knew what she was saying. She was saying, Big Rev, I need something. I miss you. That's what I heard. Uh, but they don't know how spoiled they are, them grandbabies. But listen, true mothers know how to be stern. Uh, 
You talk to Christy and Sydney, they'll talk you about some of the talks they got when Mama drove them to school. Hmm? They still talk about them talks, and they're all grown now, huh? Why? Because Mama knows how to be stern, huh? Huh? Well, she loves them. But she also knows that if you give them everything all the time, they're going to turn out spoiled brats, and they're not going to appreciate anything. You know when you appreciate things? When you have to work for them. Hmm? Uh, that's why our country's gone insane. Uh, you can't give everything to everybody and, and expect nothing out of, in return from it because then they won't appreciate it. Uh, that's why government housing don't work. That's why welfare don't work. Uh, that's why all this wokeness won't work. Uh, 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 but my dear friends, America was built on uh, rolling up your shirt sleeves and working hard. Uh, and if you work hard, you can make something of yourself. Uh, but don't sit around like a baby bird with your mouth wide open saying, give me, give me, give me. It's out there. Go get Get it. Work for it, huh? By the way, Randy, the Corvette goes to her. She already knows that. That's all right. The boys are taken care of, too. Uh, well, they get IOUs. That's what they get. <laughs> but a true mother knows how to be stern with her children. Can I say this? That a true mother is sensitive with her children. A true mother is understanding. She'll sit and listen to them. She'll rejoice with them. She'll weep with them. But she spends a long time just being understanding. See, fathers, we're not always understanding. We're quick to discipline. But we're not always quick to understand and sit and be sensitive. But true mothers do. They're real understanding really caring we thank God for true mothers I'm thinking about all those children that are thrown away all those children that have been aborted all those children they find in dumpsters we thank God that there's some true mothers who care about their children True grandmothers care about their children. True surrogate mothers that care about their children. Hmm. And true adoptive mothers that care about their children. Hmm. Thank the Lord for a true mother who knows how to be sensitive. Can I say this? True mothers are supportive of her children. True mothers don't care what they do. They'll support them. They'll run them to gymnastics, and they'll run them to baseball, basketball practice, or whatever the, the boys are doing, and they'll run them to church, and they support them in everything they do. Hmm? True mothers watches their little baseball player out there chasing butterflies and sees Ken Griffey, Jr., You know, uh, you ever see that? I love watching the little ones out there playing because they're playing in the dirt. You know, they're out there sitting in the grass picking dandelions. You know, but oh, that mother in the stands—that's that's her darling. Hmm. Uh, true mothers are supportive. True mothers go to the play, and their kid can't act worth anything. But boy, they're so proud. Huh? Nothing, Brother Bob, more proud than knowing your kid's going to be a tree in the play. Oh, that's the best tree i ever seen. Huh? My wife is so sick and tired of that show, Everybody Loves Raymond. I watch it about every night. I didn't watch it when it was really on. I watch it about every night now because I, I, I love the old man. Me and the old man get along real well. Uh, me and Frank think a whole lot alike. But can I say, I saw one episode where Raymond's two twin boys was going to be in some play and they were going to be fairies. I sympathize with Raymond right here. So it goes back because he's not going to let his boys be fairies, wear wings and have wands and all that. So he goes back and the only parts left, Brother Jim, is they could be a rock. 
And so he brings this big old plastic rock home and puts them inside it. And they're saying, I can't see, Daddy. I can't breathe. But you're a good rock. There's nothing like a rock. So what happened? He gave in and gave them back their wings. That's why the show went off the air. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But true mothers are supportive. Now think back about Rizba. Every day. For five months, she honored her sons and the sons of other women by not letting fowls come and pick at their carcasses and not letting beasts do that. Every day she fought them off and she stayed there in sackcloth and ashes before God. And God honored that and He sent the rain again. Can I say? Mama, you might not see much happening in your children's lives. You just keep being devoted for God. And one day God will send the rain. The blessings will come. Just be a true mama. You know what this world needs? More true mamas. Miss Annette was telling me about a young man. Teenager. 14, came into the office the other day. He's 14. He weighed 80 pounds. Skin and bones. The clothes he had on was way too large for him. And he'd been kicked around from family to family, and his aunt had had him. And now a foster family had just taken him in, and they was going to care for him and take care of that boy. He had never been shown what a true home was supposed to be there are children like that everywhere and all children want is to be loved and accepted can I say that's all anybody wants is to be loved and accepted and as children of God we need to look around get out of our little bubbles and realize there are people all over this world that just want to be loved and accepted and we ought to show them the true love of Christ and show them that Jesus cares. Show them that there is a better way because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Show them what he offers. He said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And I joke a lot about that Corvette, but to be honest with you, there's no true joy in things of this world. Uh, you say, but it's a Corvette. Yeah, but it gets dirty. you got to change the oil. You're constantly working on them and maintaining them. And, and to be honest with you, oh, the top's down and you're running around and you think, boy, this is nice. But there's nothing like knowing Jesus. Amen. Having a peace that passes all understanding. Uh, Brother Clint drove Miss Rhonda's car in today and it was so pretty. I told him, I said, every time I see it, it looks pretty. He said, it's got a chip in it. That's the problem with earthly things. They don't last. Hmm? And too many people put too much stock in earthly things. I'm glad in eternal things. And I'm glad in the life that Jesus Christ gives. Huh? Listen. We get all of heaven in this too. I've said all I'd say this. If you've had a godly example in your life, you ought to appreciate it, especially on this day. Amen. You ought to be thankful for it. And even if you haven't, you've still got this church. And you've got people that are showing you the right way. And you're here today because somebody cared for you. Amen. You ought to be thankful for that today. Can I say, what a blessing to be loved. And what a blessing to know that Jesus loves you. And to experience His love. This morning on this Mother's Day, if your mother is still alive, you ought to contact her and let her know how much you appreciate her. If she's not alive and she's in heaven, what a blessing to know. One day you'll see her again. And because of the example she was in your life, you have eternal life. Because you too trusted in the same God she trusted in. 
you're here today and you don't know the Lord, you can. You say, preacher, what does it take to be saved? What do I have to give up? You don't have to give up anything. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Huh? Becoming a child of God is just simply turning from the direction you've been going and turning to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he'll save you. Can I say, I didn't give up anything being saved. All I did, Brother Ron, was gain. Hmm? Uh, I've gained and gained and gained some more. Huh? Everything I have is because the Lord's been good to me. Huh? And he has blessed me, not only with temporal things, but he's blessed me with eternal things. What a blessing. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, you can. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation, invite you to come, trust in him. During the invitation, if you're a child of God and God's been good to you, you ought to thank him. Amen. You ought to let him know, I appreciate the goodness that you've bestowed on my life. I appreciate that you put people in my life that showed me you, whether it was your mother or not. You ought to be thankful you know the Lord. Do you know most of the world has never even heard the name Jesus Christ? And we not only get to hear it, we get to know him. Amen. And you can know him today. I wonder, do you know him? And if you do, do you appreciate him? Are you willing to be devoted to him in the most troublesome of times? Rizba did. Amen. I can think of nothing worse. And yet here she is, devoted before the Lord. How about you, friend? Are you willing to be that devoted that you raise up honor to your children? That's what she did. You say, how important was that, preacher? We're still talking about her some 3,000 years later. Uh, all I know is her name's in the Bible. Mine's not. Hmm? Because what she did was honorable. And all God asks of us is to be honorable. Will you be honorable before the Lord? Some are already come. Let's all stand this morning. Brother Clint, if you miss Tina, come get a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. So, preacher, I, I'd love to get saved. I don't know how. If you come, we'll take a Bible and show you how to be saved. You can be saved today. If these are coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Father. We know that's an odd text for Mother's Day, but God, you just kept speaking to my heart about Rizba. Now, Lord, I know in my inability I could not convey how much of an effort that woman gave as a, being devoted as a mother to those two sons. Lord, I know it impacted not only Israel, it impacted heaven because you allowed it to rain because of what she did. Now, Father, I pray you'd bless now in this invitation. I pray you'd speak to hearts. The altar's already full. Lord, I realize that there are some who've had troublesome lives. They've had hard home lives. But, Lord, through it all, they've come to trust in you, and we thank you for that. Lord, there may be some here today that doesn't know you. I pray you'd speak to their heart. There may be some today that know you, but they've gotten away from you. I pray that, Lord, they'd give their heart back to you. There may be somebody here today that knows you, they love you, they live for you every day, but inside they need some help, they need some encouragement. I pray you'd encourage them. God, just do a work in our hearts. God, get glory to your name. Well, thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.